live from Washington, it's the Insights with all the news the government does not want you to know. Now here's the host of the Inside Scoop, Congressional Attorney Mark Levine. Good evening, America. Welcome to the Inside Scoop. Whether you're listening on radio, on the Head On Radio Network, or on television in Washington, D.C. or Northern Virginia, I'm awfully glad you're here for the only place in America to get all the news the government does not want you to know. I've returned from a weekend in talk radio land. I was at a talk radio convention in New York City, and it's a strange and unusual place. A place where Obama is a closet terrorist. A place where mocking Hillary in sexist terms is de rigueur for the day. A place where rich old white men, literally, they actually said this, were the only people who mattered in America. A place where global warming, no matter how hot it is, just isn't happening. And I guarantee you it was as close to 100 in New York two days ago as it is 100 degrees here. No, I went into the enemy land, I went into masochism land, because we do have a talk radio media that is very much skewed to the right. At a time when Dick Cheney has a 14% approval rating, it seemed that most everyone there was a big fan of him and of President Bush. And the only mistakes President Bush has made has been to be too liberal. Now, the irony of the talk radio world is that even though the great majority is to the right of center, the little bit that's not tends to be far to the left of center. You know, I'm a Clinton-Gore-Obama Democrat. I'm a moderate liberal. I'm someone, frankly, who doesn't even like labels. I simply call it who it is, someone who strongly believes in the rule of law, believes in the Constitution. And yet, conspiracy theories seem to abound on the right and the left. On the right, global warming is a conspiracy. It, it can't possibly be true. On the right, they actually believe Barack Obama is some Manchurian candidate, some kind of closet Muslim able to appear at any moment, even though he says nothing of the sort. Let's be clear, there's a little bit of racism in that view. And then on the left, you have crazy people supporting 9-11 conspiracies. Not that George Bush didn't do enough to stop it, that we know, but that people planted charges in the towers and all kinds of crazy things. There is very little place on the media spectrum for someone who has views where 70% of America has views. 28% of the American people oppose the president, disagree with George W. Bush, and yet those 28% are the only ones represented in talk radio. Then on the left, maybe 5% support Kucinich, maybe less than that support the uh, 9-11 conspiracies, probably only 1% support Ralph Nader, and yet, where I am, WPFW, a lot of listeners support that. And I'm not knocking that. You have the right to believe whatever you want to believe. All I'm saying is the middle 70% of us aren't really represented. And nowhere was that clearer to me than at the talk radio convention. As I said, it was 98 degrees in New York City, just as it's 98 degrees here in Washington. And yet global warming for them is some kind of myth. It's something that, well, there's scientists on one side and there's scientists on the other side. Never mind the fact that you've got 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 scientists saying it's a problem to every one or two that say it isn't. And the one or two that say it isn't, well, they happen to be all paid for by the oil companies. But you see, the oil companies are made for Republicans. It is the oil companies that finance Republicans. It is the oil companies where Bush and Cheney and even Condoleezza Rice got their background. It is a party made for and prepared for the oil companies. They're the ones who control our energy policy. They're the ones who get a lot of money to Republican campaigns. And so when we see gas prices at above $4 a gallon, when we see our president go hand in hand to Saudi Arabia, begging them, please, please, please help us. We'll even give you uranium. We'll even give you nuclear power if you just help us. Well, the reason is, I think, correlated with the fact that Exxon and Mobil have the highest profits of any corporation at any time in the history of the world. Not America, the world. So I go to this convention and really surprising things go on there. It's as if they don't realize how they're seen outside, well, the rarefied world of talk radio. For example, they gave an award to Bob Grant. 
I don't know if you know who he is. He's someone, frankly, I don't follow very much. But he's someone who has said a whole host of racist things. Now, I'm not going to say them on the air. I don't really care to repeat them. You can do the research yourself. But let's just say he's called Martin Luther King names that I wouldn't call my enemies, that he has said that certain people need to die, really extreme stuff, and yet he's given an award by, by talk radio. Outside the award, there were protesters, protesters who gave me a long list of the things that Bob Grant had said, and I agree with the protesters, agreeing with them that, hey, this is pretty extreme stuff. The guy shouldn't be given an award. Now, I'm not out to stop free speech. He can say what he wants. I just don't think he should be given an award. And yet, who gave me the petition? I asked that guy, who are you going to vote for? Are you going to vote for Obama? No, he's going to vote for Ralph Nader. He's someone from the far left who's given up on America. And frankly, I think, like many of the far left, wants to see the whole thing collapse. He wants McCain to win, so he's voting for Ralph Nader because he hopes the entire country will fall apart. Well, you know what? Shame on you on the right. Shame on you on the left. Shame on both sides. Shame on anyone who doesn't recognize that there is a middle America that just believes in the rule of law, that just believes in the Constitution. While I was there, they gave an award to conservative talk show host Laura Ingram. And they gave it to her as the woman of the year, the woman who had best exemplified what women could do in talk radio. And, you know, she's a successful talk radio host. I understand that. But, but woman of the year? Laura Ingram is the one who said on air when talking about Hillary Clinton that a president shouldn't be crying president shouldn't be crying. Now, that is wrong in so many different ways. Why is that comment sexist? Well, first of all, it's just wrong. Hillary Clinton didn't cry. She got a little teary, a little bit emotional when talking about her campaign in the ways that, yes, men do all the time. But here you have a woman attacking another woman for acting like a woman, as if there's something wrong with that. Don't we want a president who feels emotion? Don't we want a president who cares? Do we really want a president who doesn't give a damn about the way the world is, about the way it works, about getting a little bit emotional from time to time? And yes, George W. Bush has cried as well, as has Bill Clinton, frankly, a lot. And this is the woman that they choose to honor? Likewise, it was amazing to me when you had talk radio do a demographics thing. Now, they're out to show that their talk radio, this was the big stations in New York City, WABC and so forth, that they were appealing to the people. And so there's this wonderful graphic up there, and it was done without irony, without humor. I, I wish I, had, I could show you the video of it. It was a closed convention. But they have this graphic on there, and they show the headlines for some conservative talk radio hosts. And they say he was 18th in the market. Okay, but then they say, what if you look at, voter, at uh, listeners who are 35 to 65? Oh, now he jumps to ninth. Well, what if we look at men only? Well, now he jumps to sixth. What if we look at other? What is other? They only defined it once. Other is non-ethnic. Non-ethnic. Non-ethnic in Republican talk radio speak is code word for white. Okay. Don't want to say white, that sounds a little too KKK. So they say other. White, male, and old, and his ratings jumped up to third. He said, but what if we add the word rich? Oh, he didn't use the word rich, they used with money. So we have, oh, males of a certain age with money who are other. In other words, rich, old, white men. How do rich, old, white men do? And they could have thrown in, I guess, Christian. Well, he's number one in that market. Well, I got a little news for talk radio, and they're going to get mad at me for saying this. But you know what? America isn't all rich, old, white men. Now, there's nothing wrong with rich, old, white men. If you're a white man who's 65 years old and you earn over a million dollars, God bless you. I'm glad you're watching my show. You deserve a voice. Of course you do. But not all of America earns over a million dollars, is 65, is male, and is white. There are other Americans out there. So here you had, without irony, without irony, talk radio celebrating the fact that, well, yeah, even though they were 18th in the marketplace, among rich, old, white men, they were number one. And then they made the next plug. They said, well, who controls the money in America? Who controls the advertisers? Who are the richest people in America? Rich, old, white men. I want you to think about that for a little bit here. Think about that. Without irony, 
Without irony, they point out that rich old white men have all the power in America. And then they say, we are serving rich old white men. And then they're saying, we, we are popular because, well, people want to listen to us. Now, do you see a contradiction in there? I know I do. The same right-wing talk radio, the one thing that they point out again and again and again throughout the conference, and again, I'm spilling the secrets because I give you the inside scoop. I'm letting you know how it is. They probably wouldn't appreciate this. But they were going on and on and on against the fairness doctrine. There was nothing more awful, nothing more evil than the fairness doctrine. What is the fairness doctrine? Well, the fairness doctrine existed from well into the 1950s, well up into the 1980s, till it was ended by Ronald Reagan. The Fairness Doctrine said that if you give a specific view in the media, on television, you got to give the other view. You give that view on radio, you got to show both sides. You give a view that promotes John McCain, you got to give a view that promotes Barack Obama. Now, I understand problems with the Fairness Doctrine. I do. I believe in the First Amendment, and I understand how, well, you want to be able to advocate for a certain side. But you know what's so funny about the Fairness Doctrine? If there is enough viewpoints on both sides. Well, you wouldn't need the Fairness Doctrine, right? I mean, the whole point of the Fairness Doctrine was if all of it is weighted toward one side, well, then you need it for the other side. Now, I don't want government bureaucrats deciding what speech you should have, but when you have a talk radio world that consciously admits that they're seeking rich, old, white, male dollars, and they don't give a damn about African Americans or women or people who are middle class or Oh, young people. Nah, young people. They say young people don't know anything. They, they don't care. You got to wonder. Then you see all those young people and those non-white people. And they're going out and, and supporting Obama. You see women. You see poor people. And they're going out and supporting Hillary Clinton. And I think there's going to be a mix as they come together. I, I really think we will come together. And you wonder who that world is serving. So, you know, I go there, masochist that I am, I tell them who I am, I'm an ex-congressional attorney, I used to work for the Democrats on judicial. I worked on the first version of the Patriot Act, you know, the one that Maxie Waters and Lamar Smith signed on, the far, far left and the far, far right, the one where we all came together as a way to fight terrorists, which I believe in, to give us the tools to fight terrorism, but also to protect civil liberties. The first draft of the Patriot Act, the one that was thrown in the trash, where an hour later they gave us the next draft, the one that became law. They didn't want to hear about compromise. They had a panel of talk radio hosts up there, and eight to one thought that McCain would win. Now, I understand it's going to be a close race, but the most recent polls show Obama slightly ahead. All of them were certain that John McCain would win. And why were they certain about that? Well, they were certain because Obama to them was a closet Muslim. Now, you and I both know, because you're sophisticated listeners out there, that Obama's not Muslim. He's Christian. In fact, he got in trouble for his pastor, remember? But those kind of contradictions don't really affect these people. They honestly believe that because Obama's father is from Africa, bingo, he's a closet Muslim. He's a closet Muslim because, let's face it, he has some relatives in Kenya who are Muslim. So, at the heart of the problem with Obama is that his father's from Africa. I want you to think about this. Conservative talk radio's problem with Obama is the fact that he's a half African. And ask yourself why this industry is honoring a racist. If you disagree, you agree, call in. Let me know. 877, excuse me, 888-488-MARK. More from the Inside Scoop right after this. Some dreams are universal. Dreams that inspire us. Multiple sclerosis is a devastating disease that changes lives forever. The National MS Society does more for people with MS than any organization in the world. But we can't do it alone. To get involved, visit us online at nationalmssociety.org or call 1-800-FIGHT-MS. This is why we're here. Because nobody dreams of having multiple sclerosis. 
What's wrong with this picture? Half of young Americans can't locate economic powers like Japan and India. 20% can't even find the Pacific Ocean. Without geography, our children aren't ready for the world. Geography is everywhere. It's incredible creatures. Rhythm, fashion, flavor. It's economics and politics. It's change. Understanding connections between people and places is critical in the 21st century. That's why we created MyWonderfulWorld.org. Go there now for your free parent and teacher action kits and give our kids the power of global knowledge. Because kids who understand our world today can succeed in it tomorrow. We are back to the Inside Scoop. Call in live and let your voice be heard. Here again, your host, Mark Levine. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. I am Mark Levine. I am both a talk radio host and a television host. And I entered the rarefied world of talk radio conventions in New York City. And it's kind of amazing what I found. What I found is no sense of irony. If you want to call in, by the way, join the discussion, please do so. I encourage you, whether you agree with me or disagree, the toll-free number is 888-488-MARK, 888-488-6275. In the talk radio world, they have a hard time understanding how the media world is changing. And they look like chickens wondering why the sky is falling. They ask, they really do, and they do so with the most wonderful sense of, oh, I don't know what's going on in my world. They want to know why African Americans don't listen to their brand of talk radio. They want to know why women don't listen to talk radio. They want to know why young people don't listen to talk radio. And they want to know at the same time as they admit in another session that they're reaching out to the rich old white men in America. Well, let me tell you why African Americans don't listen to talk radio. And I can say this as the token white guy on black talk radio on the power on uh, XM satellite radio for, for a long time. African Americans, like most Americans, want someone on the air who can relate to them. And I don't mean you have to be black. It, it helps, but I don't mean you have to be black. I mean you have to tell people things that ring true to them. If you say to an African American, if Bill Clinton lies about sex, it's not about sex, it's the law. And we want the president to follow the law. And at the same time you say, but we don't think George Bush has to follow the law about warrantless wiretapping. And we don't think George Bush has to follow the law on torture. And we don't think that the president ever has to send his people to Congress, even though Congress has oversight under this document, the Constitution of the United States. African Americans, many of whom are traditionally suspicious of the government, let's face it, the government discriminated against them for a very long period of time, slavery, Jim Crow, and, and even some today, that they're going to probably turn off your radio. If you say to young people, for example, that gay people shouldn't have equal rights, that I, I believe that the church should decide the law, that because I'm Christian and because most of America is Christian, I think America should be a Christian nation, just as Christian as perhaps uh, the Taliban is uh, Muslim. If you say that, well, a lot of young people are going to be turned off. A lot of gay people are going to be turned off. And yet talk radio doesn't seem to understand this. The amazing thing about it, though, is all the shifting words there. A conservative in talk radio land doesn't call himself a conservative. And I say him because most of them are men, although there are a few women. He doesn't call himself a conservative. He calls himself a libertarian. To me, that's an insult to libertarians. I respect libertarians. What is a libertarian? A libertarian is a person who believes that the government should stay out of our lives. Now, whether it comes to individual lives or your public lives, I either agree or disagree with libertarians. Let me explain. Libertarians think government should stay out of our private lives, and here I completely agree with libertarians. I don't think the government should decide who we marry. I don't think the government should decide what books we read. I don't think the government should decide what religion we practice. I don't think the government should decide what we do with our own bodies. These are libertarian principles. They are liberal principles. We agree on that. Now, I disagree with libertarians when it comes to helping people. Libertarians believe, for example, that we should not have Social Security, 
that we shouldn't have Medicare, that if you're disabled, you're on your own, that if you're five-year-old with leukemia, you just die. Now, in that way, libertarians agree with conservatives. But conservatives call themselves libertarians are just trying to fool you. How do you know? Well, you don't ask them the questions they agree on with libertarians. I know conservatives hate Social Security. They hate pensions. They believe children who are five-year-old with leukemia, they should just die if they're poor. I, I know that. But libertarians also believe in individual rights. So I asked these conservatives who call themselves libertarians, you do believe the government shouldn't decide who we marry? Oh, no, I think the government should decide who we marry. Well, but that's not a libertarian principle. Yes, but it's a Christian principle. But that's not libertarian. Oh, but I'm a libertarian because I'm against government regulation. I'm against universal health care. I'm like, wait a minute. What about drug laws? A libertarian believes that our drug laws are fairly oppressive. That if people smoke marijuana, for example, you don't have to hire them. I wouldn't hire a stoner. But at the same time, you don't put them in jail. They're ruining their own lives. They have a right to do that. Or people who gamble, maybe ruining their own lives. Hey, I like uh, poker. I admit it. But it's, it's our right. It's all right. I'll even throw in pornography. It's all right, as long as it's not you know, with children or, or you know, showing violence or things that would otherwise be crimes. So there's freedoms. There's liberty that libertarians and liberals share. In fact, liberty is the source of libertarians and liberals. But what you notice is that conservatives who call themselves libertarians never seem to support the liberty. The liberty to read what we want to read. They're the ones who want to censor people. They want to take books out of our libraries. They want to put prayer in our schools. And I assure you, it's not any prayer. It's only their particular prayer. If they're Protestant, it's Protestant Christian prayer. If they're Catholic, it's Catholic Christian prayer. If they're Orthodox Jewish, I, I don't know. I don't think they can have a difficult time putting that in public schools. But it's not Allah, and it's not Buddha. And when you talk to these so-called libertarians, these conservative talk show hosts about Islam, they seem to confuse Islam and radical Islam. Now, I'll be the first one to agree, and this is, I guess, where you call me a moderate, I agree that radical Islam is a major problem. I'm going to talk later on in this hour about U.S. foreign policy and some of the ways I disagree with some on the left about, for example, the nature of the Iranian threat. I consider it a threat. There is a threat from radical Islam. But I also know that radical Islam is a majority, excuse me, is a minority, big difference, is a minority of Muslims. It is the radical right that thinks they're a majority. In fact, when I was talking with people off the record, they would say things like Muslims want to take over the world, Muslims want jihad, Muslims want you know, to have an emirate that exists throughout the world. And that may well be a goal of radical Islamic states. That may well be. It may be, well be a goal of radical Islamic terrorist groups like Al-Qaeda and Hezbollah and Hamas. But that's not true of most Muslims, most American Muslims, most Turkish Muslims, most Indonesian Muslims. They're praying to one God that they call Allah that's not so different from the Jewish and the Christian God, and they believe in peace. That's what the majority of Muslims feel. But you see, you got to have a bogeyman. You can't really be on the right. It seems you can't be in talk radio unless you have a bogeyman. My bogeyman, people who break this law, people who break the Constitution, people who won't follow the rules of government. And that's true whether it's the executive branch or the legislative branch or the judicial branch. The, you know, the ones that put Bush into power against the Constitution in 2000. I'm for the rule of law. But they need an enemy. And the enemy for them is Islam. And the sad thing about it is, because they have this great enemy, Islam, a billion people, and they label all of them the enemy, they have no idea how to protect American security. See, to protect American security, you've got to understand that there are differences. There are differences between Shia and Sunni. John McCain claims to have all this experience, but he can't tell the difference between Shia and Sunni. Let's face it, most Americans can't. But it's not your job to understand the difference. My listeners are sophisticated. Most of them understand that, for example, Iran and Al-Qaeda are enemies, that Saddam Hussein and Al-Qaeda were enemies. Most of you all get that. John McCain doesn't understand that, and the right-wing people who control talk radio don't understand that. And they don't understand it because, let's face it, it's a lot easier just to blame everyone. But we can't attack a billion people. We shouldn't attack a billion people. 
the great majority of Muslims, just like the great majority of Christians and Jews and Buddhists and Hindus and atheists, just want to live their own lives. They just want a better life for their families. Simply does not understand. So one of the things I found really interesting in talking with uh, the people in the talk radio land and for their children, this is something that the right wing thing, is that when you explain to them that, hey, I do believe in the rule of law, and I do believe there's a threat from radical Islam, and I did support the war uh, in Afghanistan, which I did. They attacked us, they murdered 3,000 Americans. We had a right, we had a duty to go in self-defense and to defend ourselves against Al-Qaeda. They say to me, well, Wow, you're a rational liberal. You're a liberal who believes in the Constitution. You're a liberal who believes in the rule of law. And their eyes glaze over. And they like can't believe that I exist. What's the irony? The irony is that my views are very similar to Obama's views. If you listen to Barack Obama and you hear what he has to say, he doesn't say that he ran. One of the things I found very interesting is not a threat. He agrees that Iran is a threat. He agrees that Iran should not be allowed to have nuclear weapons. But Obama points out that George Bush and his administration helped Iran become powerful by taking out the counterweight to Iran, which is Iraq. Most liberals support the Constitution. The great majority of them do. The reason why we were so upset by the Supreme Court choosing the president in 2000 is because under this document, the Supreme Court has no right to choose the president of the United States. Most liberals support the rule of law. That means that Congress has a right to find out from the president what he's up to, to call in his officials, to ask them to testify, to find out what's going on. We believe in the rule of law. And the irony is that conservatives have said for so long, we're rule of law people, we believe in law and order, that they've actually fallen belief. They believe their own lies. They believe their own lies. And so I come in there, and I, of course I support the rule of law, and of course I'm patriotic, and of course I'm against radical Islam. And they say, well, you're a rational liberal. Most liberals are rational. Yes, we've got a few crazy 9-11 conspiracists. I don't even call them liberal. I call them leftist. A few of them are out there. But when it comes to the rule of law, conservatives don't know what to do. When we come back, I want to tell you about a story of a personal conversation I have with Michael Medved. You may have heard of him. He is a typical talk radio host. He's not even the most right wing of the talk radio hosts. And we had an argument about the rule of law. And there in front of lots of people who were listening, he lied to my face. He lied to my face, hoping to trick people into believing what he had to say. I'll give you that conversation when we come back, along with all the news of the week. If you want to call in and add your two cents, 888-488-MARK, back after this. This year, 28,000 Americans will be diagnosed with oral cancer. Every year, 7,000 Americans die of oral cancer. I'm Eva Cohen, and I'm an oral cancer survivor. I didn't fit the profile. I didn't smoke or drink. I had no family history of cancer. 31 years old, 31 years old. I went to see my dentist about a sore in my mouth that wouldn't heal. It was oral cancer. I had to have a radical neck dissection and a portion of my tongue reconstructed. I didn't know if I was gonna live or die. I'm Surgeon General Richard Carmona. The survival rate for oral In two weeks, see your dentist. Early detection is the key. Early detection saves lives. I know. One in eight Americans goes hungry. One idea helped change that. A community started a garden that blossomed into farmer's markets. One in six children lives in poverty. One group of women found an answer by opening a daycare center that their neighbors could afford. Today, 36 million Americans live in poverty. But one by one, people are helping you have a sore or lesion in your mouth that doesn't heal with one of hope for easy ways you can help visit povertyusa.org two words for you pop quiz ready name any funny movie a drama name a mystery and one more thing name the movie your kids saw today in science class when we come back, you know what really matters? 
Know about your kid's school and know about your kid. Find out 100 ways to know more, do more. We are back to the Inside Scoop. Call in live and let your voice be heard. Here again, your host, Mark Levine. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. As a TV host and a talk radio host, I do go to talk radio conventions. And I don't know why I'm surprised. I know the world in which I live. I live in metropolitan Washington, D.C. The District of Columbia gave 90% of its vote to John Kerry in the 2004 election. Bush didn't even crack double digits. He got 9%. If you look at the Virginia a part of Northern Virginia within the Beltway, or you look at the Maryland part within the Beltway in metropolitan Washington, D.C., and even substantially outside the Beltway, it is majority Democratic. 60, 70 percent of the people, they support the Democratic Party. They're left of center. They don't agree with George Bush and Dick Cheney. In fact, if you go to Baltimore, that is also a heavily Democratic city, as is the state of Maryland. So then you come to a, a radio station like WMAL that serves greater Washington, greater Baltimore, serves an area that's at least 80% Democratic, maybe 10, 15% moderate, maybe 5% right-wing conservatives. And you talk to Chris Berry, the head of WMAL, and I don't mind naming names. Chris Berry and I have had this conversation numbers of times. He knows what I'm talking about. And I said to Chris Berry, why on your radio station do you only serve these 5%? And he didn't dispute my statistics. He agreed with me that in Washington, D.C. and Baltimore, maybe 5% were far right-wing religious conservatives and 95% were not. And he said, well, those 5% are very loyal and they listen all the time. And I'm like, okay, all right, they need a voice. They're Americans. They deserve a voice. But you want to make money. You're a capitalist. Wouldn't you make more money if maybe just a little bit of the time you would allow 95 percent of your listening audience to hear people who agree with them and not just the five percent of your listening audience he said mark you may be right go you buy yourself a radio station and show me you see he has corporate sponsors and corporations support the rich old white men we were talking about the religious christians the part that 14 percent that loves dick cheney that's who corporations support. Who do you think Halliburton supports? Who do you think GE supports? This is a normal corporation, but they, they are allied with the military. Who do you think the great telecommunications companies support? If you know anything about the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, you know that one of the things it did is it provided immunity to telecommunications corporations. It said, in effect, that if they're asked to break the law, they can do so with impunity. Now, the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution says, and I quote, it's one of my favorite parts of the Bill of Rights, that the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated, and no warrant shall issue but upon probable cause. Basically, if you want to spy on people, you need a warrant. You go to a judge, a neutral judge, you explain why you believe this person has committed a crime, and then you get a warrant and you go look, and frankly, the most, most warrants are granted. Now, the president has said he doesn't need a warrant. John McCain has said, in voting against uh, the bill that would require the president to get a warrant, that he doesn't believe in following the Constitution of the United States. He doesn't believe the president needs a warrant. So I was talking with Michael Medved about this, and I said, look, my loyalty is not to the Democratic Party. I like the Democratic Party. I generally support their candidates. I don't always support their candidates. My loyalty is to this, this document, Constitution of the United States. My loyalty is to my country. My loyalty is to the rule of law. If you don't like the law in America, then what do you do? You work to change it. That's what I've done my entire life, working in the legislature as a congressional attorney, working as a grassroots activist, work to change the law. I've written a, a substantial legislation working to change the law. I don't believe with the radical left that you should go and avoid the law and promote revolution. I don't believe it from the radical right either. Now, there are times, rare times, when the law is so stacked against you that you do have to do civil disobedience. I think the civil rights movement has shown there are times when the best way to go and to argue in a law is unfair, particularly a law that's unfair to minorities, when the majority supports that law, like Jim Crow laws, then you have to march, be willing to go to jail, and so forth. But in general, the best way to get a law changed is to work to change that law. 
So I said to Michael Medved, my problem with George Bush, my main problem, above all, above all my disagreements with him on policy, is that he is lawless, that the president refuses to follow the law. And that I had my disagreements with George Herbert Walker Bush. I had my disagreements with Ronald Reagan. I even had some disagreements with Bill Clinton. But all of them followed the law. Indeed, the only time when I know that Bill Clinton may not have followed the law is when he lied about his sex life, which frankly is a question that he should never have been asked in the first place. But granted, all right, granted that was a fault of Bill Clinton. He lied about his sex life. George Bush has lied and broken the law in ways that have spied on 100 millions of Americans, that have tortured people in violation of the Eighth Amendment, that have brought us to war based on lies. So I said, my problem with the president is that he's lawless. And conservatives who claim to believe in the rule of law should agree with me. Michael Medved said, he hasn't been lawless. Tell me where he's broken the law. I said, OK, I'll give you a specific example. The Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act is the exclusive means by which the president can spy on Americans. Now, where does this come from? I've talked about it before. It, it, it was a law that came in 1978. I think it's true to this document, the Constitution and the Fourth Amendment. It came because, let's face it, J. Edgar Hoover, head of the FBI, had been spying on Martin Luther King, spying on Nixon's political opponents. And when Nixon and another talk radio host by the name of G. Gordon Liddy, who's all famous and gets lots of applause at these conventions, even though he organized an effort to break into Democratic National Headquarters and steal documents. You know, burglars, as long as they're in the cause of liberty, Republicans love them. Ali North, another, another talk show host. But what were they really trying to do? The Watergate burglars were trying to get information on their political opponents, on the Democratic Party, just like J. Edgar Hoover was trying to get information on Martin Luther King. So in order to stop that, Congress in the 70s and the president signed a law, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, and it sets up a secret court, and they can go there, they get 99% of their warrants approved, they can get retroactive approval, they can uh, even call them up in the middle of the night. But the one thing they got is this was the exclusive means, the exclusive means by which the president could conduct warrant tapping. Now, exclusive means exclusive. You know what the word exclusive means. Exclusive means it excludes all other things. But like Republicans who complained that Bill Clinton said, it depends on what the definition of the word is, is, now they're debating exclusive. So Michael Medved, in front of an audience, said to me, oh, it didn't say exclusive. So in front of that same audience, I said, Michael Medved, with witnesses here, I will bet you $100 that the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act says exclusive. He said, oh, well, it doesn't say exclusive means. It says exclusive approach. Well, I didn't have my law book with me. I thought it said exclusive means, but I couldn't guarantee, $100 guarantee, that it said exclusive means. It might say exclusive approach. And then he went on to say exclusive approach means that it, well, the president can kind of do what he wants. It doesn't mean anything anyway in wartime and so forth. I said, Medved, I think it says exclusive means. I'm not willing to bet you on it, but I'll go look it up. I'll go check because I think you're wrong. Well, I went, I checked. Guess what? It does say exclusive means. The president broke the law. Now, if talk radio hosts really cared about America, if their first concern, as mine is, were the Constitution, were the rule of law, they wouldn't just complain about Bill Clinton. They would also complain about George Bush. They would understand that the president being lawless and spying on 200 million Americans is as bad as, nay, much worse than, Bill Clinton lying about whether or not he committed adultery. You know, and Bill Clinton says he didn't lie. He didn't have sexual intercourse with that woman. He had something else. As much as they mocked Bill Clinton for playing with words, mocking and playing with the word exclusive is a far more serious offense. So what do the conservatives there? They, they, they couldn't really place me. They said, well, you're a rational liberal. I said, most liberals are rational. And I said, tell you what, I will actually persuade you that certain liberal principles are correct. Let's start with one. Let's start with something that many of them would say all the time. Well, we've got to have tax cuts for the super rich. Why? Because the rich people are the engines of the economy. And they repeat that just back and forth. Rich people are the engines of the economy. Rich pe and I said, no, they're not. I, you know, I have a degree in economics from Harvard. I'm not trying to pull rank here. But 
Rich people are not the engines of the economy. Middle class and poor people are the engines of the economy. And you don't have to study economics to understand this simple fact. I said, in a minute and a half, I will persuade you that rich people are not the engines of the economy. That if you give a tax cut to very rich people, it might help the economy this much. But if you give the same tax cut to middle class and poor people, it'll help the economy this much. And they said, OK, try me. So here you go. Here's the two minute reason why you can tell your friends that middle class and poor people are the engines of the economy. It's very simple. Imagine a very rich man, and he has a car factory. And that car factory produces cars. Now, let's say we're going to give a tax break of $10 million. And we're going to give these $10 million to this man who's worth $100 million. He's a CEO of a major uh, car corporation. We give him $100 million. What's he going to do? He has nothing to do with it. The guy already owns 12 cars, three yachts, and a small Latin American island. He has no place to put the money. Even if he's like Duke Cunningham and buys ice sculpture that uh, urinates vodka, even that doesn't cost $100 million. So what does he do? He puts the money in the bank, and he checks his little checkbook, and it's got more money there. Maybe he puts it in stocks. I mean, wherever he puts it, you know, the Saudi government will, will put the same $100 million there as they're buying us up anyway. It's, it's the, there's no shortage of capital for the super rich in America. Now take that same $10 million, and here's what we're going to do. We're going to give $10,000 to 1,000 middle class people. Same money, $10 million. 10,000 to 1,000 middle class people. These are people earning, oh, 50 grand, 70 grand, and they have one car, but it's a married couple. They've got two jobs. They've got two jobs in one car. They can't afford another car. So what do they do? Uh, the husband drops the wife off and then goes to work, or the wife drops, picks up the husband, and then she returns home. They need another car. They get $10,000. What are they going to do with that $10,000? They're going to buy another car, right? They buy another car. And that money goes to the, 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 the rich car owner, car factory owner. Now. If he ate 100 million, he didn't build a new car factory. There wasn't enough demand. But now we've got 1,000 people each demanding cars. Or give $1,000 to 10,000 people, you have 10,000 people demanding cars. He needs to build another car factory. He needs to hire people to staff that car factory. He needs to train people for good, high paying jobs so they can work in that car factory. And then those people, they get money from their salaries, they spend it, they buy goods, they need more goods. The trick is poor and middle class people. What do they do? They spend their money. They don't have all the wealth in the world. They spend their money, and there's a multiplier effect. And then the rich guy has to build another company, and the money just keeps going. Poor, middle class people are the engines of the economy. And guess what? At the end of the day, the rich man does well, too. He gets all the money from people buying his cars. Everyone gets better off. There is a reason why, during the Bill Clinton years, the poor got richer, the middle class got richer, and the rich got richer too. Don't worry, rich people. Don't worry, rich old white men. Under the Clinton years, you made more money than ever before. Under the Obama years, you would make more money than ever before. What's the difference? The difference is under Obama, everyone is better off. All of America is better off. And isn't that what we want? Isn't that the reason why young people are flocking to his campaign? While McCain is whining and Hillary Clinton is talking about herself, it is Obama that's inspiring the nation to reach above, to go beyond red state and blue state, to bring us all together in the ways that the talk radio world can't even fathom. 888-488-MARK, your last chance to call in. I want to hear from you. We'll be right back after this. There's more than just books at the library. Il n'y a plus que de livres à la bibliothèque. Hello. You have a lot of great
great books here today. You know there's more than just books at the library. I know. There's more than just books at the library. I don't want to be hooked to a machine. I want all the medical treatment available to me. I wouldn't want my family to have to make this decision. My doctor knows what's best for me. An advanced directive is your life on your terms. Talk with your family. Decide what's right for you. Then put it in writing. Documenting my wishes today means my family won't have to make heart-wrenching decisions later. To learn more, visit www.putitinwriting.org. 1,200 American youth run away from their home. Help. 1-800-RUNAWAY. If you are a runaway, thinking about running away from home, or a parent or guardian concerned about issues facing your child, call us 24 hours a day. 1-800-RUNAWAY. In times of crisis, hope is just a phone call away. 1-800-RUNAWAY. We are back to the Inside Scoop. Call in live and let your voice be heard. Here again, your host, Mark Levine. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. If you agree or disagree, I'd like to hear from you. It's easy to do. Just pick up the phone, dial 888-488-MARK, 888-488-6275. Let me know. And if you disagree, I'm willing to take you on. I'm willing to talk to you. That's the difference also between me and most talk radio hosts. You know, most talk radio hosts on the right, they don't allow anyone who disagrees with them on the line. They do allow sometimes what I'd like to call, sorry folks, stupid liberals. They allow people who really don't know what they're talking about on the air, and then, well, they uh, <laughs> let them show the, their ignorance. And there's some on the left that do the same. There are people in left-wing radio that don't allow people, conservatives, on. I am proud to say that right here on the Inside Scoop, I value all opinions. That's those of you that call in, and also, those of you, I, I have conservatives on my show all the time. Because I think Americans need to talk with each other. I do think red staters and blue staters need to talk with each other. I, I went into the lion's den, like Daniel, into uh, conservative talk radio land to talk with them. And so if you disagree with me, I want to hear from you. 888-488-MARK. What's interesting is when you ask Republicans and particularly talk radio hosts, so-called conservatives, you say to them, George Bush has a 28% approval rating. Why is it that you don't represent Americans? You're constantly singing the praises of George Bush. And they say, oh, no, 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 we're not. They say, on spending, for example, we don't support the president. We think there's been a runaway spending in the Republican Congress. And I remind them that, yes, that's true, but Democrats are fiscal conservatives. And they laugh and they say, that's ridiculous, big spending, liberals, stereotype, stereotype, yada, yada, blah, blah, blah. Well, maybe that was true in the 1960s. Maybe, I'm not so sure, it was true in the 1970s. It hasn't been true for more than 30 years, almost 40 years. Ever since Ronald Reagan, big spending conservative government is the rule. Ever since Ronald Reagan in 1980, Republican presidents run up huge deficits. Democratic presidents, like Bill Clinton, run massive surpluses. Democrats support something called pay-as-you-go in Congress. The idea that if you're going to spend on something, you have to tax so that the government doesn't run out of money. Republicans believe in huge credit card spending. They want to go to war in Iraq and not pay for it. They want rich people to get huge tax cuts and not pay for it. Did you know that under the GI Bill, the GI Bill, the cost to allow GIs, people in our military, to go to college something that we, I think we justly celebrate happened after World War II, that the cost of that bill would be about $8,000 for those that make over a million. Now, those that make over a million have made $126,000 since George Bush has become president, solely on tax cuts, solely on tax cuts, doing nothing. If you made a million a year, you made $126,000. And Congress is now asking you to take $8,000 of that 7% of this windfall that you got just for and give it back to the people who are fighting the war that you support since George Bush has become president. Solely on tax cuts. Solely on tax cuts, doing nothing. If you made a million a year, you made a war that, as Obama says, need never have been authorized and need never have been fought. But you supported this war, conservatives. 
Are you willing to give up 7% of the gravy that you got because the Supreme Court chose Bush instead of the People's Choice score? Oh, no. No, they're not willing to do that. No, they want the war in Iraq to continue, but not on their dime. Let poor people go fight the war. Let middle class children pay for the war, because let's face it, these deficits we're going to have to pay for $3 trillion over all these years. But them pay for it? Oh, don't be silly. And I think of that when I think about the threat from Iran. You see, here again, I, I don't follow the conventional wisdom of the left or the right. The right wants to invade Iran. They want to bring all our troops, I don't know where, but into Iran. Now, all our troops are in Iraq. We don't have enough troops to fight in Afghanistan. The only way to get that number of troops is to have a draft. Republicans say they don't want a draft. Where are they going to get the troops? Oh, I know where. Mercenaries. We'll pay Halliburton to send them. Great. Great. Then no one watches them. Then they can do whatever they want, and they're not even controlled by our Defense Department. Now, there's some on the left that go the other route. There's some on the left that say Iran's not a threat. They're no danger. George W. Bush being chosen president by the United States Supreme Court. Yeah, they're enriching uranium, but they want it for peaceful purposes. They want to build civilian nuclear reactors. Right. Right. The third largest oil power in the world needs nuclear reactors? After Saudi Arabia and Iraq, there's nowhere you can get cheaper oil than Iran. Now, there may be refinery problems. Why not build refineries? Why do they want civilian nuclear power? Why, for that matter, does a whole host of nations want civilian nuclear power? In this article in the Washington Post, you see a whole group of nations, Morocco, Libya, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Syria, Turkey, and Iran, and they all want nuclear weapons. Oh, excuse me, not nuclear weapons. They all want civilian energy use. Right. Now, when France wants nuclear reactors for civilian energy use, I get it. I get it. They don't have oil. They, they need it. I get that. Frankly, I'd be hard-pressed to find a single country on Earth that has civilian nuclear power that also doesn't have military nuclear power. Maybe the only example of that is Japan, and Japan could have nuclear military weapons in a second if they wanted to. So no, I don't trust the Iranians. I don't believe, as some on the far left do, that Iran's not a threat at all, that they're trying to be peaceful. Indeed, I understand that because of our war in Iraq, Iran is more powerful than ever, and because of Iran's threats, all these countries want nuclear weapons. That's not good. We don't need another arms race. There is a middle position between invading Iraq and say, excuse me, invading Iran and saying that Iran is perfectly safe. And who has that middle position? Obama. Yes, you may think Obama has a liberal position. He doesn't. If you listen to what Obama says, he says a number of very interesting things. He says, number one, he's willing to talk with the Iranian government. He says, number two, that Iran will not be allowed to have nuclear weapons and that he'll take no options off the table. It is Obama who's the realist. It is Obama who understands that we can't completely trust Iran, nor do we have the resources to invade Iran. We need to sit down and have some hard negotiations. And here's the secret about Iran. I'll show you an article from the Washington Post. The secret about Iran is that Iranians love America. You may think I'm crazy. There's an article right here in the Washington Post I have. Stars and stripes in their eyes. Most of the Middle East hates America, but Iranians see a more appealing image. It's their own president they can't stand. Persians, and they're not Arabs, Persians tend to be very favorable toward America. Here, in fact, is in the article, there's a Persian man selling rugs that look like the American dollar. Can you believe it? So it's not hatred of America here. What it is is, let's face it, a dictatorship, a theocratic government that most Iranians don't like. There's high inflation. There's a lousy government that is focusing more on war and more on its nuclear program than on its own people. So what are we to do? One thing we can do, I hope, is reach out to the Iranian people. You know, prior to Ahmadinejad's crazy 
attacks about wiping Israel off the face of the earth and destroying America and annihilating all these things, there was another Iranian president. His name was Khatami. He was a relative moderate. He was a guy we could have talked to. He was a guy we should have talked to. He was a guy who was in power for eight years, and George Bush did not talk to him. Bill Clinton didn't either, but he only had like a couple years to do it. I blame both of them, though. We had a chance to reach out to the Iranian people who like us, who support America, who support Israel. You'll find more support for Israel in Iran than anywhere else in the Middle East, outside of Israel. So we didn't reach out to them. Obama is right that we need to talk to Iran. But he needs to talk to them in the right way, with, yes, the threat of a stick held behind us. The irony is that George Bush claimed to do the same thing in Iraq. He claimed to want to talk to Saddam Hussein using the threat of force as, you know, a stick, carrots and sticks. The problem is George Bush didn't mean it. As Scott McClellan has talked about in his book, George Bush pretended to support diplomacy while carrying war as a last resort, when all along George Bush wanted war. So that when Saddam Hussein actually allowed our inspectors in, he still went to war. And he got Congress to do the authorization as a last resort. What Obama understands is that we need real talks with Iran. We need to reach out to the Iranian people, go over the heads of their theocratic leaders, and speak directly to the Iranian people. I would hope that, in fact, Obama would insist on giving a speech heard by every single Iranian, because they're the ones who need to listen. They're the ones who largely support us and don't support uh, their own government. There still can be peace there, not for the far right way of invading and not for the far left way of trusting, but something in between. And I have to say that I like the way Obama has clarified that he won't talk just to talk. He won't talk unless he can do things that will be in America's interest. This may surprise people. It's interesting. I talk to people uh, on the far right at this uh, talk radio convention. I talk to people on the left. And both of them seem to have this view that Obama just wants to accept Iran the way it is. It's not true. Obama understands tough diplomacy. Tough and diplomacy. Talk to our enemies, but always recognize that they are our enemies. There is an in-between. And if we have to use nuclear weapons, excuse me not nuclear weapons, if we have to use a military force to take out nuclear weapons, that's always an option. It's what Israel did with Syria, and if you notice, Syria couldn't even complain because they were caught in the act, caught with their nuclear weapons. All options are on the table, but the best way is always diplomacy. And if Iran understands that our threat is serious, our sticks are serious, but our carrots are serious too, I think they can still back down from their nuclear program. If you want to write on anything I've said today, go to my website, RadioInsideScoop.com. Let me know what you think about today's show. For now, this is Mark Levine, signing off.